So it's a pleasure to have Tom Hartman from Cornell, and he's going to tell us about islands in cosmology. So thank you, Tom. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Fun to be back. Uh, so I hope we'll have a lively um, seminar. So I'm going to talk about a paper from uh, the summer with Ikun Jiang and Edgar Shigulian uh, on islands and cosmology. So the uh, islands that I'm talking about here are the quantum extremal islands that have recently uh, caused a lot of led to a lot of progress uh, in black holes. So let me remind you what the situation is there. Uh, so there was a proposal by Pennington and separately by Almerian collaborators for a new formula for the Hawk, for the entropy of Hawking radiation. And here's the formula. So we're interested in calculating the entropy of this region R, or I'll, I'll call this region R throughout the talk here. I called it rad for radiation. Um, that's the region whose entropy we want to calculate. This is um, the, the Think of this as collecting the Hawking radiation from an evaporating black hole. And what the formula says uh, is that you should first include an island inside the black hole interior. That's the blue region. Uh, and then calculate this quantity in brackets, which is the generalized entropy of the island. It has two terms. The first term is the area of the island. So that's a gravitational contribution to the entropy. And the second term is uh, the um, von Neumann entropy of the combined region, of the island union, the radiation. So this SQFT, this goes by various names in the literature. This is sometimes called S matter. Uh, what I mean by SQFT is just the, the entropy that you would calculate using the ordinary methods of quantum field theory and curve space. It could include some contributions from the gravitons, uh, but it's just an ordinary quantum field theory von Neumann entropy. Okay, so here's the, what the formula says. We should calculate this generalized entropy here, then extremize over the choice of island. And finally, if there's more than one extremum, we should choose the one with minimal uh, entropy. And uh, the exciting thing about this formula and this proposal is that it gives the unitary page curve for black hole evaporation. At late times, the island, uh, you can find the extremum, and the island turns out to be the entire black hole interior. It goes all the way up to the, the event horizon here. Um, and what that means is that the SQFT term, the, the matter entropy term here, just drops out of the formula. Well, it's important for finding the extremum. But at the extremum, it basically drops out. Uh, and that's because what's happening here is that you have a large amount of entanglement between these two regions. You have a large amount of entanglement between the Hawking partners on the outside and the interior partners uh, inside the island. And what that extremization procedure is doing is it's basically picking the piece of the interior that's uh, highly entangled with the, the radiation that, you, that you've collected. So it's picking out the highly entangled region. This term uh, then is zero, because if you have access to both, a, both a, a, an entangled particle and its, what, if you have access both to a particle and to its entangled pair, partner, uh, then that's pure together. So that doesn't contribute. So this drops out. The, uh, formula then just gives a, the, um, the area term. And since the boundary of the island sits on the horizon, this is a quarter of the area of the horizon. And it goes to zero as the black hole evaporates. This is exactly what was predicted uh, by Page should happen in the unitary black hole evaporation. Um, so the, so this, is, this, this is a formula for the entropy. Uh, which I'm, I'm sure you've seen. I'm just sort of setting the, setting the stage and the, and the notation here. Um, but it's not just a formula for the entropy. It's also, uh, it suggests an interpretation. And um, that interpretation in ADS CFT is known as entanglement wedge reconstruction. Uh, the idea is that this is not just a formula for the entropy. It really is telling you that there's some kind of duality here. 
it's telling you that the island is encoded in the radiation, in a sense, similar to holographic duality. Now, it's not, it's not reducing the number of dimensions. So it's not similar in that way. It's not holographic in that it's encoded on the boundary, but it's holographic in the sense that you have a quantum state of, you have a state of quantum gravity that's being encoded in the state of a quantum field theory, or in this case, at least a region where gravity is, is, is not very important. This statement is given the entropy formula, this statement in principle that the island is encoded, this is almost a theorem in quantum information. Uh, and I won't go into the caveats there, but this is, I would say strongly suggestive that there's some kind of duality at play here. Okay, um, so before we get to, so what we're gonna do in this talk is we're gonna, I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna ask whether we can apply similar ideas to cosmology. Before we get there, um, I wanna look at the black hole case and ask when does the island appear? Well, it appears exactly when the information paradox appears. And uh, the information paradox appears uh, when the entropy of the Hawking radiation becomes too large. So uh, it appears at the page time, uh, which is the time when the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation, uh, this really should be, there should be a, well, we need to subtract off the initial entropy. So I'm, I'm being a little imprecise with this formula here, but um, it basically appears when the entropy of the Hawking radiation is larger than, than the gravitational entropy of the black hole. So when this is greater than a quarter of the area of the black hole, that's an information paradox because you can't have more, you can't create uh, any more entropy than that by entangling with the black hole that only has area over four degrees of freedom. So that's when the island appears uh, and starts to, to dominate. And that's also when the page curve turns over if you think of it in terms of the page curve. Equivalently, uh, well, equivalently, we could phrase this without ever even referring to the Hawking radiation because the Hawking radiation is, is in a entangled state with the black hole interior. On, on a full Cauchy slice, the quantum fields are in a pure state. Uh, so the, the entropy of the Hawking radiation is the same as the entropy of the black hole interior. Uh, so an equivalent way of saying this is that uh, is this equation here that, that the information paradox appears and the island appears exactly when the quantum field theory entropy inside the black hole exceeds the area. And I, I rephrased it this way because this is now a statement only about the black hole. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with what, uh, who, who's, how much radiation we've collected or, or um, who's collecting the, the radiation. It's just a statement about um, the quantum fields inside the black hole violating some kind of holographic bound. You might think that, ho that holography uh, or entropy bounds would prevent this from ever happening, but of course it doesn't. Uh, there are a few cases where, it, where this bound can be violated and the black hole interior is one of them. So the conclusion here is that the island appears when the quantum fields inside the black hole violate this Bekenstein-like bound or holographic area bound. We weren't sure actually what to call this bound, the area of a four bound. So I think I'm, I'll probably keep switching around to what I call it. Um, the, the original Bekenstein bound was for static situations. Uh, and it was, it, you, can, you can translate it into something that looks like area of a four. Um, so now we're talking about time dependent situations. Bekenstein did not, did, did, not, um, did not put a bound on, on situations like this, but I'm still calling it the Bekenstein area bound. A caveat here is that we're gonna to need to deal with the UV divergences. Uh, these inequalities, once you start worrying about UV divergences, these inequalities are meaningless and that's gonna be important and I'll come back to that. So now that I've phrased it this way, uh, it's clear that the next question should be, what about cosmology? Okay, so I think we understand black hole evaporation and black hole interiors a little bit better than we did a few years ago. Uh, so now we should go back and ask whether we can understand quantum cosmology a little bit better. 
Uh, there are a lot of similarities. In fact, I think a lot of people think of this, the problem of, of black holes as uh, partly as a warm-up problem for, for the problem of the Big Bang. Uh, so there are a lot of similarities. There are sing there's cosmological singularities, there are horizons, um, there are entropy relations, there are, there's time dependence. And perhaps most intriguingly for our purposes, uh, cosmology is famously uh, the other situation where uh, this area bound becomes violated. Okay, so uh, this was uh, discussed by Fischler and Susskind and by Busso uh, 20 years ago, 20 some years ago, that um, Bekenstein's area bound in time dependent situations is famously violated in a few situations. One of those is black hole interiors and the other is in cosmology. The reason for this violation in cosmology is very obvious. One way to think of it is that entropy and cosmology is extensive, it scales with volume. Uh, so if you take a big enough volume, uh, you're always gonna be bigger than, than area. Another way of saying it is that if you take a fixed volume, uh, co-moving co -moving entropy is, is constant in cosmology. So if we take a, a fixed co-moving volume and go back uh, toward a Big Bang singularity, then the scale factor is going to zero. So this area term, this area factor is going to zero while, while the left-hand side is, is, is fixed. Is there a question? I, yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment quickly that in, in fact, you don't have to go to cosmology to violate this bound. Uh, you, can, you can violate it in any room if you're just surrounded by some funny surface that wiggles yes. up and down in time. Absolutely, uh, so, but you have to pick a weird surface. I'll come back to the yeah. weird surface. Um, yeah, wiggly, so wiggly surfaces will also violate this. And, and um, we're gonna see why that's not a good place to look when uh, in, in a few slides. Okay, are there any other comments at this point, questions? Okay, so, so the outline of, of where I'm headed, uh, first, I'm gonna begin with some general criteria for islands. I think of this as the island hunter's guide. Okay, so this is not gonna be specific to cosmology. I just wanna lay out some general criteria that all islands must satisfy. And then we're gonna use this as a, as a guide for finding islands in cosmology. Because when we started this project, we didn't really know what cosmologies to look at uh, or which ones to try. And um, we found this a useful way of, of thinking about it so that we could quickly consider all, all sorts of different cosmological models and setups and, and figure out where the island should be. Uh, then I'll go on to the actual cosmology examples. There are, so to, to, to jump to the, um, to the final result, uh, there are cosmologies with islands. So we're gonna apply the island rule. We're gonna find, we're gonna find cosmological islands. But I think unlike the black hole case, the interpretation of these cosmological islands is uh, still unclear. I don't know, I don't think we've extracted yet uh, what the ultimate lesson of these cosmological islands is. It's very interesting that they're there, uh, but at this point, I don't really know what to make of them. So I'll, I'll conclude with a little bit of interpretation, uh, but um, I think it's still, it's still a little blurry. Okay, so I'll start with just general criteria for islands. So the question that I wanna pose is the following. When can a region I be an island for some region R? And in particular, I don't wanna say which region R. I, I want the, I want, I'm looking for criteria that are independent of region R. I'm just asking um, if, if you just hand me a region, a black hole interior say, uh, I wanna be able to answer the question whether it could potentially be an island for some region R. R you can think of as, um, as the radiation, like the Hawking radiation, but we're not talking about evaporating black holes here. So R is, is just analogous to the radiation. I is analogous of, is the island. So of course that's analogous to the inside of the black hole. I need some terminology to state the, the general criteria. So here it is. Classically, a region is called normal if uh, 
it behaves normally under null deformations. What I mean by behaving normally is that uh, a normal surface will uh, shrink under inward null deformations and grow under outward null deformations. The area will grow under outward and it'll shrink under inward deformations. A region is called, so that's the definition of normal, a region is called quantum normal if the same thing is true, but not for the area, uh, but for the generalized entropy. So this S gen here is the uh, area plus some quantum uh, von Neumann entropy for that region, the, for co the contribution from the quantum fields. So now I can state the three conditions that I think of as the island hunter's guide. An island I must satisfy these three necessary conditions. One, I violates the Bekenstein area bound. I'll come back to this one. Actually, I'm going to derive, I'm going to derive condition one. I'm going to skip the derivation of the others, but this we're going to derive. Uh, condition two, I is quantum normal. Islands must be quantum normal regions. Uh, and third, the region surrounding I, in fact, any region surrounding I must also be quantum normal. Condition two was actually was actually discussed already in the in the um, first island paper of Almeria and collaborators. Um, good. So these are the three conditions. These are what we're going to use to to guide us towards cosmological islands. These are necessary conditions. Uh, so any island must satisfy these. They're not sufficient. However, uh, every situation I know of where these three conditions are satisfied does have an island somewhere in the somewhere nearby okay so they're they're not sufficient in the sense that every region satisfying these is an island but they do seem to be sufficient in practice in that if you can if you can satisfy these three conditions you do seem to always get islands in all the examples i know of there's not a theorem or anything Okay, so I'm going to discuss in a bit of detail this first bound, uh, the first condition rather, the Bekenstein area bound. So the statement is that the Bekenstein area bound must be violated by the island. I think to the, to the experts, this will at first sound totally obvious that of course islands must, must have entropy greater than area. That's, that's kind of built into, almost built into the island formula. Uh, but first, I want to convince you that it's not obvious, and then I want to convince you it's, it's still true. Okay, so uh, why, why is it not obvious? Well, it's not obvious because this formula doesn't make any sense. Well, it does, but we have to be careful. So when, when we talk about the entropy of the matter fields, uh, we better be talking about the finite part of some von Neumann entropy. And um, otherwise, well, that, that's, what we want to, that's what we want to bound. And on the right-hand side, um, we better be talking about the renormalized area. So this better be the renormalized Newton's constant here so that everything we're talking about is, is finite. But um, recall that, so, but the point I want to make is that this, is, this does not look UV safe. The, remember that the generalized entropy is UV finite. That is the generalized entropy of region I, um, the island. So um, when you write down the generalized entropy, it's the sum of an area term and, and a matter term. And together, these are finite. There's a, there's a UV divergence in the matter entropy, which is plus infinity, uh, but that's canceled by the renormalization or absorbed into the renormalization of Newton's constant, uh, which is minus infinity. And that leaves over something finite. But in this inequality up here, th these two things appear on opposite sides. So uh, if we're not careful, then we're going to get something totally trivial. If we're not careful, then, then the left-hand side is going to be plus infinity. The right-hand side is going to be minus infinity. And um, this isn't going to mean anything. OK, so, so that's, that's where sort of all, all the, all the um, trickiness in, in stating and deriving this bound comes into making sense of the UV divergences. I think it's sort of obvious that this had to be true. Something like this had to be true. Uh, but the tricky part is, is getting 
it's getting a precise statement that that's not sensitive that that handles these uv issues and that's what i'm going to do in the next two slides any questions so far i have a question so so the area term you're saying that uh, if you take a renormalized uh, newton's constant it's going to give, give you negative infinity because of the pi gap those are positive numbers right uh, well this is this is just the usual um This is just the usual thing that happens when you renormalize. The, you should not think of this as a large correction. The quantum corrections to the area are small, uh, but the the when you try to write that in terms of a bare piece and a renormalized piece, you have to you have to add an infinite correction. So this is this is just a, the usual issue of of adding adding something to the bare Newton's constant. Okay, so in some sense you're subtracting some infinity from that. Yeah, that's why you get some negative infinity. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so here's the derivation of the bound, and in the process, we're going to make this. We're going to deal with these UV divergence issues. I'll be a little bit brief. I just want to give you a sense of the ingredients that go in. Um, and it's okay if we don't get, get every quantity here, but the, the idea is the following. Uh, for the island to exist, to really exist, it has to dominate over the no island. You can, the, if, if you just have no island at all, that's always an extremal surface. It's the nothing surface. That, uh, so in order to have a non-trivial island, your island must have entropy that's, that's lower than the no island entropy. These two, uh, these two entropies involve some infinities in them, um, but by reshuffling terms in this, so just by writing down the island entropy and reshuffling terms and moving things around a little bit, you can write this in terms of things that are UV finite. And that's been done in this next line here. This is the same inequality, I've just moved some terms around. Uh, so it says that the mutual information of I with R has to exceed the generalized entropy of I. Mutual information, uh, UV divergences cancel in the mutual information. And uh, as we just discussed, the generalized entropy is also the finite quantity, UV finite quantity. Okay, so this is now written in a nice way in terms of finite stuff. Uh, now what we're gonna do is uh, use strong subadditivity on, on this. So, uh, what I've done now is I've defined a region called out. Out is everything outside the island, except for a little sliver uh, around the island, and that's going to act as a regulator. So this white region is not included in out. Strong subadditivity tells you that the mutual information of I without is larger or equal uh, than the um, mutual information of I with R. That's one way you can phrase strong subadditivity is that if you uh, grow a region, the mutual information can only go up. Uh, so now if we, if we compare that to our existence of islands formula uh, inequality, then what this says is that I, the mutual information of the island with the outside of, of, this is the mutual information of the inside of the island with the outside of the island has to exceed the generalized entropy. This is very intuitive. This is just saying the, for an island to dominate, it must be very entangled with something. That's what this, that's what this formula is telling you. How entangled? Well, it must, th that's, that's what this formula says. It tells you how entangled it must be uh, to, to, to be able to be an island. Now, actually, the left-hand side, which seems a little peculiar because of this, this regulator surface, but actually, this is something that's been discussed before. Uh, this is the finite part of the entanglement entropy. This, was, this is a regulator, uh, the mutual information regulator for entanglement entropy that was introduced a few years ago by Cassini, Huerta, Myers, and Yale. Uh, so what they showed is that this 
mutual information of a region with its complement uh, gives you a nice definition of uh, the finite of, of the finite part of the entanglement entropy. Actually, it gives two times the finite part uh, plus some um, corrections. Those corrections are UV finite, uh, but depend on the um, the details of this of this regulating strip, the white region surrounding the island. So now we've written this in a, in a nice UV finite way. Now we can sub just subtract uh, the finite S finite, subtract one S finite from both sides. There's one, there's two on the left and there's one here in the generalized entropy on the right. So we subtract that from both sides and now we have the inequality that we're looking for. It says that the finite part of the entropy of the von Neumann entropy of region I exceeds its area over four. There are some dot dot dots here, and if you go through the if you go through the details of the derivation, you can keep those dot dot dots, and we know exactly what those correction terms are. Um, so this is now uh, what we what we have here is a well defined UV finite. Uh, Bekenstein-like Bekenstein area bound that must be violated um, by islands. So that makes precise this, this intuition that this intuition that islands should have uh, a lot of entanglement with something in order to be islands. So I went through that in, in detail to, just to give a sense for the kind of ingredients that are, that are going into this. I'm not going to give the derivation of the other two conditions. The details are a bit different. The tricks are a little different, but they're all from this same sort of uh, tool bet, toolkit. So here are the conditions again. We did the first one, the violation of Bekenstein, then there are these quantum normal conditions. Uh, I wanna emphasize this Busa versus Bekenstein. Okay, so I wanna emphasize that um, it really, I'm really talking about the Bekenstein non-covariant entropy bound of Bekenstein. I'm not talking about the Busso bound. The Busso bound is, is a true bound, as far as we know, uh, the, the, covariant, the covariant entropy bound. Um, so what's being violated here um, is something else. It's this, it's this holographic like non-covariant entropy bound. Uh, and, there's, there, and it was known, uh, it was known that that could be violated. In fact, I think that was uh, one of Raphael's motivations for, for introducing the, the Busso bound. The other point I want to make is that the quantum normal conditions compete with the area condition, that it's very difficult to satisfy all three of these. To give an example, uh, I want to mention this, this situation that Raphael brought up a few minutes ago. So uh, this is an example where we consider a region I with a very wiggly with a very wiggly boundary. Okay, so uh, if, if a region I has a boundary that wiggles in the time direction like this, then, uh, well, if, if you take any region I, say with some matter in it, you can always give it zero area just by putting some wiggles in the, in the, in the boundary like this. Um, so it's very easy to violate the Bekenstein bound, the Bekenstein area bound, just by introducing these wiggles. The, the entropy in region I is, is basically unchanged because we've hardly changed the, the region, but the boundary now has zero, zero area. But this competes with the other two conditions and, and you can't introduce these wiggles while, while staying quantum normal because um, when you introduce these wiggles, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make the expansion um, very large at the top of the wiggles and very small at the bottom of the wiggles, um, so that these the top of the wiggles will be will be trying to give the um, generalized entropy one sign. The bottom of the wiggles will be trying to give the the gen, the will be trying to give these uh, derivatives of the generalized entropy rather the the other sign. Um, so it'll just be impossible to find a region if what so making it very wiggly is also going to make it so it. It's neither normal nor anti-normal um, because, because of this rapidly changing sign of the, of the expansion. So these, these conditions are, are sort of competing with each other in a way that makes, them, it makes it hard to satisfy all of them. And I think that's why in practice, it seems to be 
a good way of finding islands is just to look for situations where all three conditions are satisfied. And then um, it's very likely you're gonna find an island nearby, which is what happened when we went to cosmology. Okay, any other questions about this? I'm now gonna move on to the actual cosmologies. Uh, yeah, Tom, I, I had a question. Um, yeah. Couldn't you ask whether there are islands, even if they don't dominate? So even if the entropy of the island isn't larger than the entropy of the no island? So like what, what would happen in that case? Yeah, let's see. I f if the, the quantum normal conditions, um, those come only from extremality. Okay, so the, so the quantum normal conditions um, apply even to, to subdominant islands. And then the statement that it dominates, that's, that's, that's related to this Bekenstein area bound. Um, so those are, those are two independent things. And you're right, we could, we could use the quantum normal conditions to look for subdominant islands. But I'm really interested in here in, in dominant islands because um, I, well, I think we know even less about how to interpret a subdominant island. Um, so I, I, in particular, I don't think that there's a strong argument that there's any kind of duality for a subdominant island. There might be, but I don't think we have a strong argument for it. Okay, thanks. If, if you just have the quantum normal conditions though, it doesn't imply there's an island, right? Whereas the, your, your Bekenstein bound plus the quantum normal, that, that like provably implies there should be a dominant island. No, uh, it, does not, it does not prove that. It does not prove that. Um, I think it should. Just do a, a restricted maximum on the, like for, it, it depends on what, you're, you're, what system you're trying to find an island for. But if, if the system you're trying to find an island for is, is what you call the like out, like the regulated everything outside. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah. That, then, then it provably like. Um, I, I think, I think the maximum, I think the procedure that you're, that you're suggesting is going to depend on what you choose for, for your region R. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, I'm saying for, if you if your region R is the region out that you called out the one you used to define the Bekenstein bound violation. Um, yeah, but that's we generally don't want it to be out because sure, out, because sure. out out is a region that that extends like in the black hole case out reaches yep, all the yep. way inside the black hole like we don't yeah, we yeah, don't yeah. want to pick that as our region so but I agree yeah if we if we pick that region yeah well, in mind a situation where the um, the island that you're looking for may not be the region I that you started. Um, sorry, did you did you ask? Who, I couldn't you asking, hear. I thought I was asking Jeff. I couldn't hear because of wind. <laughs> There's a, yeah. Oh, sorry. Me, uh, or with less wind. I guess the, the statement I was making is that if you replace the region out by the region R in defining the Bekenstein bound violation, which quite recently you might say is no longer a Bekenstein bound violation condition, it's some stronger condition. Uh, I mean, it's the condition that the generalized entropy be, be less than the entropy of R. Um, then then you're, you're guaranteed to have an island. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, uh, is that island going to be the region I that you started with, or do you are you just guaranteed no, to have some? No, it, it's something inside I. There'll be there'll yeah, be some so islands. That's, that's a different problem, right? It's a it's the, I, Tom looks for a region R that is going to match a given I, so that I is exactly an island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And and yep. whereas what you're talking about is yep. more uh, similar to what uh, Arvin yep, and I did. Exactly. Yeah, where um, you know we may not find exactly what the island is, but yep. we'll know there is one, and we'll have an upper bound on the entropy. Yeah, yeah, I, I understood. Yeah, we we actually were were initially trying to do something like what Raphael and Arvin did, which is just just show that there had to be islands. Um, I think that um, to do that, you really have to specify what region what region are you're talking about. And that's that's yeah. why we so we didn't we didn't we were looking yeah. for we were looking for some necessary and sufficient condition on I itself, um, and we didn't find one. 
and and Raphael and Arvin did find one because they also include. I, I think they had to also include information yeah. about regional. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So this is uh, this slide is basically the the main the main result. So let me um, explain it carefully. Um, so this is a situation that has islands, but um, I just want to explain the setup first. So the setup is we're doing an FRW cosmology. That's over on this side. So this is, think of this as the actual universe. Uh, well, maybe some model of the actual universe where maybe the scale factor is a little different. Um, so this is the FRW cosmology. And there's, so in FRW cosmology, there's matter. It's not just empty. There's there's matter in a thermal state, uh, and what we're going to do is purify that matter um, by adding a an auxiliary space. Okay, so there's some matter here in FRW, which is which is thermal, and we're going to double the matter um, by and and add the second space time. Um, I'm assuming that. The matter fields are at large n, so I can ignore the gravitons when I do this, and we just double the matter, the, the say a CFT that's on this FRW. So we double the CFT into this fake uh, auxiliary system, the auxiliary Minkowski space. Uh, now we put the matter and the we put the real the real matter and this auxiliary matter into a thermal field double state. Um, that, so now, the, now the, the full state of the matter here is pure. Um, and what we're looking for are islands in the cosmology. We're looking for islands in the cosmology. The motivation here is we'd like to have some kind of holographic handle on cosmology, the same way that we now, at least in principle, have a holographic handle on black hole interiors. So we want the island to be in, we want the cosmology itself to have an island. Uh, and with this, thermal field double setup, what we can do is we can fit, we can consider the problem where we pick a region R in the auxiliary space. So you should think of R here as like the Hawking radiation and the auxiliary space is like, is like far from the black hole and R is like the Hawking radiation. The cosmology is like the black hole interior and then I is like the island, of course. So that's the, that's, how to map it onto the, onto the black hole problem that you're probably familiar with. Um, and so that's what, so, th so that's a setup. We have this thermal field double universe and uh, we're gonna look for islands in the FRW region. Does that make sense? Um, okay, and so the so whether we find these islands or not will depend on the details. So I'll give uh, first. Um, uh, no, sorry, we're going to do this first. Okay, so there there are two ways to look for these islands, the hard way and the easy way. So the hard way uh, is to use the island formula. So that is consider all possible i and r in this figure on the previous slide. Calculate the matter entropy. That's the hard. That's what makes this the hard way. Uh, calculating the matter entropy of I union R um, is difficult and I think um, not really doable for, for, for general regions, at least certainly not doable exactly. Um, and it's gonna hard, take a lot of hard work to, to um, even come up with an approximation for that. Uh, but if you can calculate it, then you can look for extrema of uh, the generalized entropy, because those are the quantum extremal surfaces, and those are going to those are going to give us the islands. Okay, so the, so the hard so the direct calculation is quite difficult because the matter because the calculation of these matter entropies is quite difficult. Then there's the easy way. So the easy way is to apply the three conditions to region I. Notice that in in the hard way, you really have to talk about both universes, and you have to talk about the entanglement entropy of, of joint regions that are that have a little bit in each universe. That's what makes it hard. Whereas in the easy way, you only have to talk about FRW itself. 
So this is really just a question for the cosmology, whether it satisfies the three conditions. These are very easy to check. Uh, for example, to calculate the entropy, you look up in a cosmology book what the entropy is, um, or, or you calculate it, it takes two lines. So that's, that's an easy calculation, unlike this, these joint entropies. Um, and when you do the easy way, these, these are just necessary, they're not sufficient. So you, you're not quite done. Uh, if Once you apply the three conditions, this just tells you where to look. Uh, and now you have to actually do the, do the hard calculation to make sure the islands are, are, are really there. But it turns, out to be, it turns out to be still a good shortcut um, because once these tell us where to look, they tell us for what configurations, uh, they, they tell us what I to look at. And that actually, um, then you can just guess region R as we'll see in a minute. Um, and it, it actually becomes tractable to, to calculate this. Um, and then you can check that the islands really do exist. So that's how we'll do it. I guess going back to this picture, uh, you can kind of guess what's going to happen if there are islands uh, that that region R and region I are just going to be mirror images of each other, or or I don't know what the word is. They're going to be they're going to be identical looking regions, right? Because what the island wants to do is it wants to pick the uh, region that's highly entangled with R. So um, they're going to end up just being similar regions on the two sides similar looking regions. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the strategy now for the results. Um, so uh, first a case with no islands. This is the flat FRW universe, uh, radiation dominated FRW with zero cosmological constant. We just start applying the, we just start checking the conditions. Okay, so the yellow region here is Bekenstein violating this is just the statement that if you take a large enough region, then you'll violate the Bekenstein bound in FRW. Or if you go close enough to the singularity, you'll violate the area bound. Uh, so this is the Bekenstein violating region. The blue region here is the quantum normal region. I guess I, sh I should have drawn region I is a spherically symmetric region. And these, these uh, exclusion things that I'm drawing are plotting here are for the end point. So like if there was a a spherically symmetric region that ended here and covered this part, then it would be a Bekenstein violating region. So these are the regions where the endpoint has to live. Okay, so the blue is the quantum normal, yellow is Bekenstein violating. There's no overlap, so there cannot be islands. That's the end of the calculation. So there are no islands in radiation dominated FRW. We don't have to go checking every possible region R uh, to, to try to figure out if there could pop, maybe be some islands somewhere. That's it. Is there a question? Yes. Uh, so are you taking an answer so that the uh, island is uh, spherical symmetric? Yes. Yes. This is, we only checked sphere, spherically symmetric islands. Okay. Thanks. Other question? Okay, so here, here's the more interesting one. This one has an island. So this is a universe which is uh, FRW, flat FRW with a negative cosmological constant. When you have a negative CC, um, the, there's a big bang, then there's a point of maximal expansion, and then there's a big crunch. Okay, so this is a universe that has a time reflection symmetry. The, um, in fact, the scale factor for this universe is, is cosine t up to some factors. Uh, so that's what you see. It's, it's, it's expanding and then it's turning around and there's a big crunch. The three conditions are the three colors on the plot. Okay, so, so the, all three conditions uh, are satisfied if you live in this sort of funny triangly thing out here. And um, this picture is not, is not really to scale in the vertical direction. So, so the height of these, the height of this teardrop is uh, just the thermal wavelength beta. 
So really you should think of these teardrops as having almost no height. The thermal wavelength uh, of the matter is extremely small um, if this is an ordinary kind of cosmology. So um, you should really think of this as sitting basically exactly at the turnaround point uh, where, at, where, the, where the scale factor um, is at its maximum and, and the universe is just starting to recollapse. So this is where these three conditions are satisfied. And um, you can now check uh, by an explicit calculation of the, of the joint entropies uh, that, there really are, that there really are islands. And they're just for the, for the corresponding region. You pick the corresponding region in, in the auxiliary space and um, this is its island in FRW. Uh, can I uh, ask a brief question just to confirm my understanding? Yeah. So um, here in this discussion, you're, there's still like a doubled Minkowski that's like the purification? Yes. Okay. And um, like that auxiliary system you include because it's, it's kind of the analog of um, Hawking partners that purify the interior. Correct. Okay. Cool. Um, yep. Thanks. Right. So I'm only the picture I'm I'm drawing is just for the cosmology itself, but but it's imagine there's like a, on a on auxiliary experimentalist who has the the stuff that's entangled with this universe, and they're the one who would say that this is their island. They live in the auxiliary space. Um, uh, can I ask one question? Yeah. Um, do you think that we could have another condition in order to restrict more our region, because it seems to me that the G quantum normal restricts more than that I quantum normal. It, um, let's see, you want another condition or, I mean, it's true that in this case, the I quantum normal actually didn't, didn't do anything. You, it didn't help. Once we are the, once we're in the overlap of the other two, it was guaranteed. Um, is that what you're saying, or you actually are suggesting there should be a fourth condition? Yes, yes. Do you think that it could be possible to to get a fourth condition to restrict more? Well, I can tell you that I don't know the answer, but I can tell you that in this case, um, this entire region is full of islands. So this entire overlap, at least in this example, is. Uh, it's possible to find an island that whose endpoint is anywhere. Pick up any any point that you pick here, at least up to um, up to thermal wave up to the thermal wavelength. So any point in here is the endpoint of a of a valid island. So I don't know, but not a, it won't help in this case. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, the brief comment uh, is sort of an, an aside really about quantum focusing and the QNEC. So uh, there is a fourth condition sort of, if we assume quantum focusing. So if you assume quantum focusing, then the quantum extremal surface must be maximin. This is a little bit more elaborate than the way I've defined it here, but um, for our purposes, it has to be a maximum in the time direct under deformations in the time direction and a minimum under deformations in the space direction. So this was, uh, this was um, understood in this paper of Akers and collaborators um, in great detail. We have a short appendix giving a, a simple little um, sketch of, of, this, of this version of the statement. Um, so um, it's not really a fourth condition because um, it's going to be true. like if you find an island, this is this is going to be true automatically, uh, be, assuming that quantum focusing is true. But it can be a useful uh, it can be a useful guide. Like for example, uh, when we studied the FRW universe, the the Big Bang one, the first one that had no islands. Um, when we first started studying that problem, we thought we had an island uh, in in radiation dominated FRW. But it was not a maximin, and we were very confused about this and eventually realized it's because we were sitting too close to the singularity 
and um, we were really out of the regime of validity of, of low energy gravity. So it was useful, useful anyway. Uh, to check this, say for, so now returning to this recollapsing cosmology, to check this, we need to calculate the matter entanglement entropy uh, for small deformations about the time reflection symmetric point. And then we can check if it really is a, a, a maximum, a maximin like it's supposed to be. And this is interesting but it, because it probes a certain universal quadratic contribution to the matter entropy. There's a, uh, since this is time reflection symmetric, there's a quadratic, the, the, the leading term here is going to be quadratic and that comes with a coefficient, which has been actually studied previously in the context of quantum quenches. It's the same calculation of the matter entropy here. Um, and what we find by looking at our island is that it's maximin if and only if this coefficient is large enough. It has to be larger than four thirds pi times the energy density in our universe, in, in our F or W model. Uh, exactly the same condition on the quadratic coefficient of entanglement entropy was actually derived earlier by Mazet and Virueta uh, by a different method. So what they did is they applied the QNEC to a quantum quench um, and found exactly the same inequality uh, in order for the QNEC to, to hold. So this um, is not really a surprise. We know that the QNEC comes from quantum focusing, um, but it's nice to see that everything is fitting together and, and uh, we get the same condition from this cosmological setup. So as long as this condition of Mosey and Verueta is satisfied, then everything fits together nicely. We looked at various, uh, so I can't guarantee that we looked at it. At, I certainly can't guarantee or even suggest that we looked at every possible cosmological scenario. We, lo we looked at a bunch of ones that we could think of. Um, and we found only two situations with two situations with islands. Uh, and I just told you about one of them. And here is the other one. So here's the other situation that we found that, that gave an island. Before I tell you about this one, maybe I'll just tell you what we tried to look at. We tried to look at de Sitter space in higher dimensions. We tried to look at things like bubble nucleation in higher dimensions. And those calculations are difficult, but we didn't, at, at this point, um, we, well, we haven't succeeded in finding any islands in those situations. We can't quite rule them out in all, in all cases, but um, we haven't found any. So let me tell you about the other, the other case where we did find, find an island. And this was the case of um, two-dimensional de Sitter. Uh, the picture I've drawn here is two-dimensional de Sitter with a nucleated bubble of flat space-time. It doesn't really matter whether you nucleate the flat space-time or not. You could just take ordinary two-dimensional de Sitter. But what we have here is JT gravity in, in two-dimensional de Sitter space. Uh, and there's this bubble of flat space that's been nucleated and we put region R up, up, up in the bubble. So if you imagine that, well, this is not a realistic, this is, this is two dimensional, this is not like, like our um, universe, but if you imagine we're an observer uh, in, in, in the future bubble here, then we could collect some radiation, that would be region R. And then the question you could ask is whether uh, the observer in this hat, in this situation, has access to the rest of the de Sitter space, to these regions that are space-like separated, and you might think are just lost uh, in a situation like bubble nucleation or, or eternal inflation. Uh, in this case, um, what happens is that this observer does eventually gain access to the lost regions. It's very much like the black hole case. Uh, these are, um, like the black hole interior, and the person up here in the hat eventually gains access to the stuff in these black hole interiors. Two-dimensional de Sitter in dilaton gravity, uh, I don't think is a very good model for higher dimensional de Sitter. It's really more like a um, model of, a, yeah. Sorry, it, can, you probably said this, but the, re, the region I, uh, is that also in a bubble universe? 
with negative cosmological constant? You have these zigzag lines at the top, so. No, it's Is not. That's just, that's just oh. in the center. But I was just, I was just about to explain these zigzags. So the reason for the zigzags is because the state we're in here is um, it's a dil it's a it is dilaton gravity in two dimensions, and the dilaton is going to minus infinity here. It's going to plus infinity in 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 this part of DS two, and it's going to minus infinity here. So I think we should really think of this as being more like a, a black hole in DS two than like an ordinary de Sitter space, um, which is why I think why this island was possible. It's because this dilaton, basically the area term, the dilaton uh, is going to minus infinity here and, that, and that's what allows the, the island to appear. In higher- But in if, I, if I think of it as a black hole, then there's, there's something a little bit tuned, right? About the fact that the horizon for that region sort of continues to the hat. Isn't that true? That's true. Yeah, we just put the bubble here because it was a nice place to put it in this black hole. But we, you're, you're right that um, we, I mean, we didn't, yeah, the bubble really doesn't play much role because it doesn't affect the entanglement. It doesn't affect who's entangled with who. So this bubble, we don't even need the bubble or you could make, you could put the bubble appearing a little later. It wouldn't really change anything. So, so this result would still hold if you separate, if you separate them a bit. Um, yes, although you might need, if if you make the bubble too small, like say it only covers this patch here, then then I'm not sure you can collect enough enough radiation to to see an island. Your bubble has to be big enough. In order to violate the Bekenstein bound. Yeah, good. Sorry. Not, that's the, sorry. Yeah, that's, sorry. I guess that's what I'm curious about whether one could quantify um, that. Um, well, I, I think there was, I don't remember the I don't remember the details, but there was some minimal size of this region R. So if your bubble is not does not hit that minimal size, it won't it won't work. Thanks. Um, Okay, so let me end with just a couple comments about the interpretation here. And I was gonna say a few words about Brockett wormholes. I think since I'm at an hour, I'm gonna leave the Brockett wormholes for, for in case there are questions or for questions or if people wanna discuss it afterward. Um, but I'll just, so I'll just end with a couple brief comments. Um, well, first of all, the interpretation as in the black hole case is that these results suggest that the quantum state of a collapsing cosmology can be potentially encoded in a dual quantum field theory. Again, it's dual in the sense of subregion duality. It's not dual in the sense of full-blown ADS-CFT. Um, so I described it here for collapsing cosmology. There are also, uh, this also can be done for closed universes. Actually in closed universes, it's, it's, um, it's even easier to make an island because you could just pick the island to be the whole closed universe. You don't even have to worry about the extremality conditions or the Bekenstein condition. You just pick the island to be everything. Um, so it also works in the closed case, but this, the ones that I've been discussing here have been flat universes. There's some caveats and comments. So one is that in the black hole context, the island formula was derived from the Euclidean path integral. This is a story of replica wormholes. This Euclidean derivation carries over to the recollapsing cosmology uh, without any obvious problems. Okay, so this island that I described in the recollapsing FRW, there is a replica wormhole description of that island. It's important that the Recollapsing cosmology is time symmetric in order to, to say that there's a replica wormhole interpretation. Uh, because the replica wormholes come from, can start the, the starting point in replica wormholes is the Euclidean path integral. Okay, so it really applies best when you have uh, situations that have a time reflection symmetry. Now you can, you can take limits and you can escape that, uh, but like if, 
if we had found an island, say we had found an island in the ordinary radiation dominated FRW, the Big Bang FRW, uh, we didn't find an island there. But if we had, then um, it would not have had a replica wormhole or at least any obvious replica wormhole interpretation because uh, we wouldn't really know how to go to Euclidean in that situation. So the island we did find does, does seem to make sense in terms of the Euclidean path integral, but I don't wanna sound overly confident here. I do not think that we understand Euclidean gravity with a positive cosmological constant very well. Uh, if at all, the more, I, the more I learn about it, the less I think we understand about it. Uh, so I consider this result of, of the island and these, these replica wormholes to only be suggestive. And I think we really need to dig into this deeper to understand uh, what's going on with this. Um, some more steps in that direction were taken uh, in this work on, on Brockett wormholes, which I can maybe tell you about in the questions or afterward, but let me jump right to the um, conclusion. So islands give us a way to apply some methods of ADS CFT beyond ADS. These islands are available only when the entropy exceeds the um, area bound. And in particular, we can reach inside a black hole or a, cosmolo a collapsing cosmology using entanglement. Some open questions here, what, are the, what is the dictionary? How does this encoding work? In cosmology especially, I think we still need to extract the lesson here. I'm not sure what the islands are telling us about, uh, about cosmology. Um, my hope ultimately is that maybe the, they'll tell us something about how to interpret eternal inflation, but uh, we certainly don't, don't know how to, how to extract that now. So I'll stop there. Okay, thanks a lot. So let's thank Tom. Thank you, Tom, and I think we can open for questions now. Can you say something over at Rocket Wormholes? Excuse me. <laughs> what a coincidence that you've asked. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So the Rocket Wormhole is a different interpretation of. Well, they had a slightly different saddle in their paper, but you can apply it and to essentially the same saddle. So you can think of this as a different interpretation of the same saddle. Um, remember that the, the state we're talking about here is the entangled state of these two universes. Okay, so the Brockett wormholes come in if we think about, um, if we think about how this is prepared by the Euclidean path integral. Okay. So this is how you prepare the thermal field double. And um, so let me explain what this picture is. It's hard to draw pictures, including the, the cosmology. So what I've done here is I'm just drawing the Euclidean time circle. So this is the Euclidean time circle. Um, there's gravity in the red region on the left. There's no gravity in the blue region on the right. This is the Euclidean time circle. So the, the physical Lorentzian FRW comes off, comes off the time circle somewhere over here. And this one is it is it beta over, you rotate by, go around the circle by beta over two, that takes you to the Minkowski space. So this picture is supposed to be the Euclidean path integral that prepares that thermal field double. This is the path integral that you would have to study to say, look at, well, to prepare this state and also to look at replica wormholes uh, in this setup. The point of, of the Brockett, well, one of the main points of the Brockett wormhole paper is that this saddle point can happen by accident. So say we didn't try to put that circle there, that Euclidean time circle. Say we just thought we were preparing uh, a state in Minkowski um, on, in vacuum. So then we would do a path integral like this. We would, we would create it in vacuum by, by putting in the bra over here. Then we'd create our state and we'd have another gravity region over here for the ket. But we're doing gravity here, so we don't really get to pick. So this is what they call a gravitationally prepared state um, because 
involved in this path integral is a, is a region with gravity in it. Um, but we're doing, we're doing gravity here, so it might decide to close up. The, it might, that the um, bra and the ket might, might decide to loop around and, and, make a, and make a closed Euclidean time circle. We can't stop it. That's, that's something that the geometry can decide to do. And depending on what calculation we're doing in Minkowski, that might be the dominant saddle. So that's what they described in the, in the Brockett paper. And um, then you have, so when this does occur, you're essentially back into the, into the, a very, a situation that's very similar to this FRW that I was discussing. The philosophy here, or the point of view is different in that I was really starting from the FRW and, and the Minkowski was just some auxiliary space so FRW was kind of real and Minkowski was auxiliary. In their case, Minkowski is, is real, um, but there's this funny cosmology that pops up un, unordered uh, on, the other side of the, on the other side of the Euclidean circle. And that's, um, and that's essentially the same cosmology I was talking about. Um, but my point, I guess, was just that this is another, another way that these, that these same kind of saddles and same kind of islands um, contribute to a different kind of calculation with a different kind of interpretation. Uh, uh, sorry, but I thought you were holding fixed the type of cosmology that you wanted, like how big it is. Well, here, the size of the red wormhole is not fixed, right? Yeah, so we're fixing the temperature of the cosmology. So this amounts to a different, there's a different, there's a slightly different like boundary condition at, infini at infinity in the Euclidean direction. So we're imposing some boundary condition at infinity that, that fixes the size of the circle. And they are not, they, so they're letting that, they're not imposing that boundary condition. So, so in their case, the, the temperature is a free parameter. And it runs off, right? I believe it depended on which calculation they were doing exactly. Um, I so it did, like if we're going to calculate net, now we have to say who, whose entropy we're calculating, for example, because that will change what uh, the size of that circle. Any other questions for Tom? Could you elaborate more on how the replica one for calculation goes wrong with the positive or zero cosmos constant? Sure. Um, okay, so what would we want to, this is the, this is the cosmology. What would we want to do? So now you have to imagine here the auxiliary universe sitting next to it. And what we would need, to, the starting point would be a Euclidean, what we would want for a starting point is a Euclidean path integral that um, prepares the thermal field double. And I just don't know what path integral to write because it would, it, because this um, cosmology here has no time reflection symmetry. So there's no nice continuation into Euclidean. Now, maybe this can be done somehow with some complex saddles or something, but I, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't really know how to do it. The matter is not an issue. You can, you, so the problem is only the geometry. The matter is not an issue because say there's a conformal field theory living here. And we want to prepare it in a, in a thermal field double. That's no problem because we can just prepare it without the scale factor. We can set the scale factor to, to one um, and prepare the thermal field double and then turn on this FRW scale factor by a vial transformation. Mm -hmm. So that we can do, but trying to do, but, but now, now I don't know what, what to do once we're, once we're including gravity. So there isn't really a gravitational path integral that prepares that thermal field double that I know of. Could you tell how the cosmology constant uh, appears in, in the failure of um, 
I mean, in your story, I didn't find that any cosmological constant then enters. No, no, that's right. It's, it's, well, the important thing in this case is that the cosmological constant gives you a, um, gives you a time reflection symmetry. It gives you cosmologies with a time reflection symmetry. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're asking whether that has some deep connection to the, to the fact that it's the cosmological constant that's being negative. Mm -hmm. um, well, it did, it does, of course, through the FRW, through the Friedman equation, but I, I don't think the important thing is just having that reflection symmetry. It's not the fact that it's the cosmological constant. Like we have that reflection symmetry, for example, in, in equilibrium black holes as well. So the, I would naively expect the Lukovic Marasena type argument can be applied to any type of cosmological constant. Is that something wrong? With um, it? Well, higher dimensions. There, um, I don't know any way to do it. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's possible. But that mm -hmm. that logic is really logic that starts from the Euclidean path integral. Right. And now you can you can make it Lorentz you can you can make it Lorentzian by by using Schwinger Keldish and and folded path integrals and stuff like that. But the starting point is really having a Euclidean path integral. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, I just don't know how to get started. I see. Thanks. Can I can I ask a question about the inequality? The the uh, also valid uh, free uh, inequality using this information. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, is it possible for you to go back to that, please? Right, right, right here, yeah. So there's dot, dot, dot part, and on the right-hand side is one over four. I guess the G Newton is also hidden somewhere on the right-hand side, is that Yeah, correct? yes, I've set, I, I've set G Newton to one here. That's I see, I see. one over four the dot, yeah, the dot 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 part will go to infinity when the thickness of the, the the wide region goes to zero, right? Correct. Yeah. So, but I'm just curious, how do you make use of such inequality? I mean, how do you how do you actually do computation with this? Um, so, so we need to check that it's possible to make the dot dot dots uh, subleading. So in, in practice, we only look at situations where these dot to dots can be set to zero. Now, mm. if, for example, if the area went to, if, this, if some of these other terms went to zero or were parametrically suppressed somehow, like if the area term was parametrically suppressed mm -hmm. or, this, or this term was non, -ex, was, was parametric, I can't select it, the, the S finite, if these terms were parametrically suppressed, then we would really have to worry about the dot, dot, dots. Um, okay. But in the cases we looked at, it's easy to see that these are subleading because they basically because um, you can you can see how they scale with the 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 width of the white region, and you can just see that they don't they don't scale to anything large. I see. Okay. So I see. So the width is in some sense kept fixed or maybe kept large. Kept large. Yeah, it's kept large. So the, the, par the, the separation of scales that you want here is one where, where this width is um, small compared to the size of the island, but large compared to the plank length. And, okay. and, and then these dot to dots are small. Okay, all right, thank you. So, if we don't have any more questions, maybe we can let Tom enjoy the rest of his evening. Or I had a question. Oh yeah, sure. Then. Sorry. Um, in the in the slide you where you were talking about the the Brocket wormhole, I'm a little confused by the picture you drew for the um. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, what does it mean that the bra and the ket are like connected together like this? It, it looks more like you're computing some kind of trace as opposed to a density matrix. Like, how do you how do you interpret this? Well, that's sort of the issue. Is that you? you yes, 
um, I mean, you, you can imagine you're calculating some observable. So in the in in this Chen Gurbenko Maldasena paper, the observable they were calculating was some entanglement entropy in the Minkowski space. Okay, so you can if you can calculate it, and really you should sum over saddles, and this is one of them. Um, this will give you some answer for that for that observable. It might be what you might, the, the point is the following. You might think that you're preparing one state, but um, when you go to measure something like the entanglement entropy, uh, you find that you're actually in a very different state than the one that you thought you were preparing. So like this disconnected one, um, for some observables, this is a subleading saddle. It's like you're studying, it's like you're trying to study a subleading saddle and um, if you actually include the other saddles, you get the contribution from this saddle. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So, I, so, so like in the, in the previous picture, it's clear to me like, you know, it, it would be a state. And then if I wanted to compute some observable, I would just insert some operators, um, you know, appropriately in the bra and the cat parts and then glue the two parts together or something. But in the in the picture on the next slide, it looks like they've already been glued together. And so it looks like you're just computing some trace as opposed to some other, like a, like a state where I could just stick in arbitrary operator. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. I mean, the, the point is, the, the point I think of, of Brockett wormholes is that when you're doing gravity, you don't really get to pick whether you're studying a state or a, or a trace. I see. It's I see. kind of it's kind of the path integral is going to decide for you, uh, and you don't really get to pick, uh, assuming that it's correct to include these saddles. We don't really know what saddles you're supposed to include, but if you include these, then it's changing from a from an expectation value to a trace without your will against your will. Uh, that's, that's pretty weird. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. That 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 clarifies it. So any more questions for Tom? So if not, let's thank him again. <laughs>